I will pour out my life for the love of the land. Though I may not be called to a land that's far away, I will serve where he's brought me. I will trust him and obey. I will labor for the kingdom, claiming Christ as my own. Though my service won't be in the miles from my home. Into my world I will carry his name. Where he leads I will follow, I will not be ashamed. Though the field of my mission may be right where I am, I will pour out my life for the love of the land. In the streets of my city, in the home Thank you, ladies, for that. We certainly want to take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ into our world wherever we go. A great message in that song. And ladies, thank you for it. Take your Bibles, Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs in chapter number 30. Now, uh, Wednesday night in the main auditorium, this is the Bible study for the adults. And tonight we have a discipleship happening. We have ladies' Bible study happening. We have teen Bible studies happening. We have Cactus Kids Club for the Kids. We have stuff all over the campus, but this is the main auditorium adult Bible study. But tonight in our adult Bible study, we are going to study a children's passage. Uh, and I hope that it'll be an encouragement and a blessing to you. And uh, I hope we can have some fun uh, as we go along and learn something along the way. You know, God challenges us that we're to have the faith of a child. And sometimes in our adult life, with our problems and our pressures and our schedules and all of it, we can miss some things right in front of us that God has intended for us. So I want you tonight, as we get ready to go to the passage and to the message, to just try to get into your, your child frame of mind, all right? Uh, get in touch with your inner child, whatever that's going to take tonight. But uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun with that, and, and hopefully you can do that. Some of you, that's a little easier than some others, but uh, we want to try to do that together tonight as we look at this. Proverbs chapter 30, and look with me, if you would, at verse number 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, 
yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands, and in king's palaces. And tonight in our Bible study, I want us to look at this topic, incredible wisdom from insignificant creatures. Incredible wisdom from insignificant creatures. We all need the wisdom of God. You never know what a day is going to bring in the wisdom that you may need from the Lord. It reminds you of the story of the pastor, a boy scout and a computer genius that were on a plane, small, a biplane, and they were traveling and the uh, pilot came back to the cabin where the passengers were seated and began to explain that the engine had just cut out and that the plane was going to go down. And unfortunately, they only had three parachutes for the four uh, passengers. And then the pilot began to explain that he was a family man. He had a wife and he had young kids. And so he felt he should have one of the parachutes. He strapped on. He jumped out of the plane. Well, the computer genius said, well, I'm a computer genius. I'm one of the smartest men in all the world, and my company really needs me. So he grabbed a parachute, and he jumped out of the plane. Well, the preacher looked at that small boy, and he said, listen, I've lived a long, full, and rich life. It's only right that you take the parachute, and I'll go down with the plane. And the boy looked at that preacher, and he said, preacher, don't worry about it. That computer genius grabbed my backpack, not a parachute, so we're going to be fine. (laughs) And uh, sometimes in life, what's missing is good old-fashioned common sense. I don't know about you, but how many times going through life do you just you enter into a conversation or a situation and you just think, where has common sense gone in 2019? Maybe you listened to some of the debate last night and you thought, for sure, where has common sense gone in 2019? For sure. And we need in our day and culture and society a fresh dose of wisdom from God. My life's verse is Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And I believe as a people of God, we're going to be hungry for the wisdom of God through the Word of God. And it doesn't matter what we're going through. Life for you right now may be great. Life for you right now may be a challenge. There uh, may be no problems. There may be nothing but problems. But it doesn't really matter what you're facing. We all are daily in the need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing is that God is, has no shortage of wisdom. It's available for everyone in this room. We can attain it through His Word. Uh, we can attain it through good friends. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We can gain it by coming to church and hearing the Word of God preached and uh, taught. We can gain it by walking in the Spirit of God. We can gain it by asking for it. Uh, we have not because we ask not. And so there's plenty of wisdom that God has to offer. There's enough for everyone in this room. For every situation that you're facing today and every situation you will face in the future, God has an answer for you. And God wants you and I to be hungry and to be pursuing the wisdom that he offers. Now, as we come to Proverbs chapter 30, and of course the human author, the penman here, uh, guided by the spirit of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and he draws our attention to four small creatures, some that we don't know as much about, but they are huge examples when it comes to wisdom that God offers in his word. In fact, in verse 24, he said, they are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The phrase exceeding wise means they are wiser than the wisest. So there is chief wisdom to be learned through these creatures. And that's what we want to explore together tonight. Have you ever been to a zoo uh, with uh, your family or by yourself, if you're into that sort of thing, I guess. And uh, you're kind of going exhibit to exhibit and you want to see animals. And maybe on a good day you could see a bunch of animals. But have you ever been to a zoo on a day like I've been where exhibit after exhibit after exhibit, you're even wondering if there's any animals in this zoo. I mean, there's nothing, you know. And you always have that one worker down at the corner that's like, yeah, that black spot, you know, 50 yards back there behind that rock over that thing, that's a lion right there, you know. And the kids are like, really? We want to see it, you know. And you're like, I don't really think that's a lion. I think it's like a bucket or something. I'm not sure what that is back there, you know. But they've always got somebody kind of giving false hope. But if you've ever been to the zoo and you've been disappointed by uh, trying to see the animals, tonight we're going to get an up-close view of these four uh, in these exhibits that God gives us in His Word. So let's look at exhibit number one, the industrialist ant. The Bible says in verse 25, the ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Now, scientists have classified some 15,000 different species of ants. Not exactly sure how they did that, but they did. So, uh, and all of these species have one thing in common as far as the ants are concerned. They all prepare 
and plan ahead. And as we look at this exhibit of the industrialist ant, there's some wisdom we can glean from God's word. First of all, we see tonight that ants take initiative. The Bible says that there are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Now, ants are only spoken of twice in the Bible. Here in Proverbs chapter 30, in another passage, rather familiar to Bible students and certainly to parents who have been teaching children. That's in Proverbs 6. And look at verse 6 in your notes. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. So certainly there's wisdom to be learned here because both passages that speak of the ant speak of the fact that there's wisdom to be gained if we will observe and learn. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. God says there's a lesson that can be learned from the ant. There's a species here taking initiative and working hard. They're preparing and planning ahead for life. And we see that the ants take initiative. And God tells you and I to really consider our life in terms of the vapor that we have on this earth. The Bible says in Psalms 90 verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Sometimes we sit in church and we hear verses like that and we agree with it in principle. But the way that we live our life, we don't agree with it. Because we're living as if we're going to live forever. And God reminds us tonight, number your days. The day you live today, you'll never get back. October the 16th of 2019 and three, four and a half hours is going to be over and gone and you'll never get it again. So God says in light of that, number your days. Uh, don't, Don't take them for granted. Live every day on purpose. Take the initiative to live it for the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We all have the same amount of time. And God is saying, observe the industrious ant. They're taking initiative. They're staying busy. They're planning ahead. They're working hard. They're using their time wisely. And God wants us to glean that wisdom and to apply it to our life. Now, God is not advocating here that we should not have a guide, overseer, or ruler, all right? And we're thankful for uh, the structure that God has, the authority that God has. God has established the church, and we have a pastor who is the under-shepherd under the chief shepherd, and he has authority in the church. God established the home, and the husband has authority in the home, and the husband and wife have authority over the children, and there's structure in that home as God developed it. God established the government, and we live in a culture and society of order because that's the way that God designed it to be. It's to be in order and we're thankful for that. But however, God in this passage is advocating a teaching that we should be motivated by self. We should be taking the initiative and we should plan ahead. Our pastors taught us many times here at Lancaster Baptist Church that a dream without a plan is a wish. And if we want to see something accomplished, we've got to plan for it. And then we've got to work towards that goal. And we see that the answer taking the initiative, they uh, are... Uh, gathering their meat in the summer. They're preparing for the time when it will not be available. It's like sitting around saying, well, I wish I could take a vacation. We can sit around all day long and wish to take a vacation. We may never take a vacation. But if we plan the time off and the saving of money and the uh, planning of the destination and the events and all of those kinds of things, then something like that will come to flourishing. God wants us to live our life in this way, to live it on purpose for him. So we see these ants Uh, These industrialists, what are they doing? They're taking initiative. And God wants you and I to take that as well. But we see letter B that they're taking responsibility. The Bible says they are a people not strong, yet they're preparing their meat in the summer. So not only are they planning ahead and preparing and taking initiative, but they're doing it in the hottest part of the season in which there is to work. And yet they're getting the job done. They're taking responsibility. The ants are known as hard-working species, certainly not lazy. In fact, in the second account of the ants in Proverbs chapter 6, look at what the psalm goes on to say in verse 9, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. The contrast being made here, listen, we can have the work ethic of an ant and have meat uh, in, in, the, in the cold time because we gathered it in the summer or we can have hunger and, and starvation and, and go without because we have not worked diligently when we should. 
America used to be a country full of men who ran to responsibility. We are shifting to a country of men who run away from responsibility. It's interesting, a lot of workplaces you hear things say like, don't work too hard. Take it easy. You know, pace yourself. You're going to make the rest of us look bad. And on and on it goes. What are those? Those are statements reflective of the culture in which you and I live. Because we are living in a culture that less and less is taking God's wisdom in the sense of working hard and taking responsibility for oneself. And God says, look at the industrious ant. In the midst of the summer season, they're working hard, they're gathering meat, they're preparing, they're taking responsibility. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And God says, listen, able-bodied men should work. This is the way that God designed it. Far before God gave Adam Eve, God gave Adam the garden to manage. God created man with the design to work. And we understand the sin curse, there's the sweat of the brow, uh, the brow and there's a travail and all of that. But f- before that even, man was placed in the garden to be a steward of it. Work was part of God's original design for man. And it's certainly something that we want to embrace today, taking responsibility and doing our part. And certainly when we think of, of, of rendering unto the Lord what's the Lord's and Caesar's what's Caesar's and working hard and, and being responsible, but then giving one's life for the things of the Lord. C.T. Sud said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And so the Lord says, look at this exhibit, this industrious ant taking initiative, taking responsibility uh, without a king or guide or overseer is working hard on their own accord. They say there's three kinds of people, those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what the world's happening out there. And uh, and no doubt you can relate to that in your life and people that you connect with. The Bible says to you and I, whatsoever thy hand find it to do, do it with all thy might. And I'll just tell you, if you'll learn from the exhibit of the ant, you'll have salt and light in this earth. You'll have a platform of influence. Uh, People will respect the initiative and the responsibility, the integrity and the work ethic that is there because quite frankly, it's missing in a lot of places in our culture and society today and it's needed. And may God's people, not in pride, but may God's people in light of the fact that we reflect the Lord Jesus Christ and all that we do, set the right example, learning from the exhibit of the end. Well, let's move off of that one, all right? Exhibit number two, the intriguing conies. And what are these? We'll look at verse 26. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. And let's examine this exhibit and see what we can learn and glean as far as wisdom from the conies. Now, a cony is a feeble, rabbit-sized creature that lives in the rocks, okay? Uh, And it doesn't uh, look like a mountain goat or something else that you would think of that would live in this kind of terrain and in these regions. It looks really more like a rabbit, but uh, this is a coney and uh, living uh, its, its dwelling place there in the rocks. Now, why? What can we learn from the conies and, and, and the instinct that God gave them? Well, first of all, notice that conies have no confidence in self. There's a reason why these conies are living where they live. They they understand uh, their limitations, if you will. Now, conies as well are only found two places in the Bible, Proverbs 30 and Psalms 104, verse 18. The Bible says the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. So the conies find refuge where? In the high hills. What does Proverbs say? Their homes are where? In the rocks. Now, why is that? Well, conies are not a ferocious beast that can efficiently defend themselves. You just saw the picture. It looks like something you might put in a cage and in your child's room or something, right? And because of this, God placed within them an instinct to develop and to build their houses in the rocks so that it would be difficult for for other predators to find them and then uh, to uh, attack them or to eat them. And so they have no confidence in self and where they live bears true to the instinct that God gave them to protect themselves in the rocks. Now, Paul said to the believers in Philippi in Philippians 3, have no confidence in the flesh. 
And there's a great lesson to be learned here about who we truly are. The Conies understood they are but a feeble folk, the Bible says, and so their house is in the rock. And God wants you and I to understand our own limitations. God wants you and I to come to grips with the fact that we should have no confidence in ourselves, in the flesh. We're, We're not going to accomplish all that God wants us to on our own. We're not going to defeat Satan on our own. We're not going to live as we should on our own. We have to come to grips with the fact that if I have confidence in the arm of the flesh, it's going to fail me. And the Coney had no confidence in self, and neither should we. And we see then the counter was that Coney's developed their shelter in the rocks. Now, the Coney illustrates the life of a believer in a hostile world. Like the Coney's, the uh, believer have uh, fled to the rock for protection. There's a sense of their own feebleness, their inability, their limitation, their vulnerability against the foes and a realization that there's not the strength to defeat those who would come after them. And so they must go to the rock for protection. And of course, we understand tonight that our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is challenging you and I, look at the Coney tonight. They're a feeble folk. And God is saying, be willing and humility to recognize I am one of them. All right? I'm but a feeble folk. You say, I came all in here on a Wednesday night to freeze in this room and be told that I'm feeble. Yes, okay. Uh, God wants you and I to recognize, hey, we're not going to make it on our own. Every day that I want to try to prove God wrong on that point is a day I waste. And I can get up tomorrow morning and I can do this and I can do that and I can look in the mirror and I can recite uh, eight quotes and all this kind of stuff and I can say, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And I'm going to pull my head proving I cannot do it. So I've got to be willing to come to the place where I identify I'm a feeble folk. And if I don't get to the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to be in trouble. Because just like this Coney understands, there are predators out there, and it's no joke, and it's literally a matter of life and death. Friend, there's a predator out there as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. It's no joke. It's your life and my life, your family and my family, your future and my future. And so I must come to the realization there's no confidence in me. That's going to lead to utter destruction. It may not be today, but it'll happen. And rather, I must seek shelter in the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I want to live in a victorious Christian life, if I want to live an abundant Christian life, if I want to live a fruit-bearing Christian life, if I want to live a joy-filled Christian life, then I have to be willing to admit I am a feeble folk seeking shelter in the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way that God wants you and I to live. He said, here's a lesson you can learn from the Coney. Seeking shelter in the rock. In Matthew's account, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And as the elements came of the floods and the wind and the rain, there was safety because life was built on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 6, 26, the Bible says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? The psalmist said in chapter 61, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Friend, God wants to be a shelter for you. God wants to be a strong tower for you. God wants to be a help to you. But you first have to admit, as the Coney understood instinctively, I'm not going to do this without the rock. And you and I are not going to do it without the Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt as we see the picture of the Coney that he's not going to win the battle against a lion. You and I are not going to win the battle against the wicked one. It's not designed to be that way on our own. But in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can. And we must abide in the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I just encourage you tonight, when your enemy is pursuing you, and he may be even tonight, climb higher. Get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be in church. Be in God's word. Be in the prayer closet. 
Get in the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. When your enemy is coming after you or your marriage or your family or whatever situation it is that you're dealing with, get to the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where safety will lie. So we see the intriguing coney, a feeble folk, but housing in the rocks. Thirdly, notice exhibit three tonight in our journey through this zoo. The invading locust. The invading locust. Now, as we examine this exhibit, there's good wisdom to glean here as well. We see, first of all, that the locusts are unified. Look at verse 27. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. So they're all working together even though there's no oversight. Locusts are unified. They're, they're accomplishing much because of their dedication to working together. And the Bible says in Psalms 133.1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Let's all read that together. Ready? Begin. Behold, how good. God wants us to dwell together in unity. God wants Lancaster Baptist Church to be unified. God wants your family to be unified. And God says it is pleasant when brethren dwell together in unity. When we get along, uh, when we encourage one another, when we appreciate one another, this is God's plan for your life, for your family, and for his church. And he said there's a lesson to be learned from these locusts. Even without a king, they're working together by band. There's a spirit of teamwork here that we need to learn. A New York family decided that they needed to leave the crowded city and uh, head out for some wide open space. And so they bought a ranch out west and they went out there intending to raise cattle and they got there and began to settle in and prepare the ranch for this work and about a month into the endeavor a friend came from New York City to visit the family to see how things were going on the family ranch and the progress that they were making and uh, the the father met uh, the guest and began to show him around and and the guest said well what have you named the ranch and he said well I wanted to name it the Bar J Ranch and my wife, she kind of liked the CZQ Ranch, and one of our boys, he was in favor of the Flying W Ranch, and, and yet our other son wanted the Lazy Y, and so we couldn't quite figure out what we were going to name the ranch, and we thought in the spirit of teamwork and compromise that we would call it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy Y Ranch. And the friend said, wow, that's great. He said, well, where are all your cattle? He said, well, none of them could survive the branding process. And... Uh, <laughs> Just wasn't working out for him. Now, God wants us to have a spirit of teamwork in our life, in our relationships, family, and church. Paul said, and the theme of our church from our pastor in Philippians 1.27, and we'll let your conversation become, is that we come with the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, and you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. God said, that's the spirit and attitude that I want. One mind, one spirit striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, it's amazing what locusts can accomplish when they're working together. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information, and I'll do it quickly. A plague of locusts is quite a devastating natural disaster. In fact, these infestations have been feared throughout history, and they still are wreaking havoc today. Like snowflakes, one is small and weak and hard to notice, but a large group of them can destroy a land much more effectively than any king or army. Locusts are related to grasshoppers. They look very similar. However, when the environmental conditions are just right and the vegetation is right, locusts can congregate into thick mobile swarms and they can search over 150 square miles in a single day. And when they come to an agricultural rich area, they can devour all the food and crops that are there. As a result of this, they cause much damage and in some cases even famine and starvation. There are many places in the world, but today most prevalently uh, in the farming regions of Africa. The desert locust is notorious. They inhabit some 60 countries and they can grow and at a time cover one-fifth of the Earth's land surface. Their plagues can threaten up to 10% of the human world population. They consume their own body weight and food every single day. And a swarm can eat as much as 200,000 tons of food in a single day. That's enough to feed a half billion people. They can devour that in one single day. In fact, a swarm can cover upwards of 460 square miles. 
They're packed in at 80 million locusts to a square mile. That's 55 billion locusts in one storm. And in 1998, there was a swarm that flew from West Africa to the Caribbean. And scientists began to study how these locusts fly and work together in consuming this vegetation. And they learned that they synchronized their wing beats. And this reduced the turbulence, making their flying more efficient. And like fighter pilots, they were flying in perfect formation. And they even had crash detectors that would help them avoid mid-air conclusions. In fact, the scientists detected that they reacted six times faster than the human pilot. And so even in crowded airspace, uh, could maneuver and get out of trouble. Now, what was God wanting us to learn as we look at the exhibit of the locust? That, listen, you and I need to live in unity as the locusts are in unity when it comes to our life, our family, and the local church. But sometimes we don't have that unity. And often, Proverbs 13, 10 settles as to why. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. And God wants you and I to live a unified life. And God wants you and I to look at the locusts and say, listen, there's no king. So there's no one telling them to behave and be kind and live the golden rule and be in your spot and, you know, don't fly over so-and-so and don't eat so-and-so's food. None of that's happening, but they're all working together by band and the mission is being accomplished and they can do an awful lot in a short amount of time. And God is saying that if a church will work together like that, a lot can be done in a short amount of time to the glory of God. But there has to be an assistance upon unity. And we have to be willing to look at ourselves and say, Lord, help me not to let my pride get in the way of unity. I don't know, tonight it might be the relationship with your spouse. There may not be unity in that relationship. And it may be a wife or a husband and pride is in the way. It may be a relationship with a coworker, And there's just not unity. But the root of the matter is there's pride. There may be someone in this church that you're dodging, you're not looking at, you're not making eye contact with, you're not being kind. And the truth of the matter is it's nothing but a base root, a problem of pride. And God says, look at the exhibit of the locust, look at what they're accomplishing, you know how they're doing it? Unity. They're working together by band. And God wants you and I to embrace the opportunity to work together in the formation that God has given to us to get the gospel around the world to people who need to hear about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Charlie Plum completed 75 combat missions in Vietnam before he was finally shot down. As the aircraft plummeted toward the Viet Cong, Plum was able to eject himself and, from the airplane and parachuted safely to the ground. Unfortunately, he parachuted into enemy territory where he was captured and spent six years in Vietnamese prison. One day after his liberation, a stranger approached him and shook his hand and said, you're plumb. You're that fighter pilot that flew in Vietnam off the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk, and you were shot down. Plum was kind of taken back by this stranger who he did not know, knowing all this information about him. And he said, sir, tell me, please, who are you? He said, I'm the one who packed your parachute. Plum began to talk to him and began to thank him for his work. Plum began to think to himself how he always thought of the man or woman who packed this parachute, who literally saved his life in this moment of combat. And Plum looked at this man and he said, if you not had packed that parachute right, I would not be alive today. Charlie Plum is a motivational speaker. He goes around the country and the world telling the story. And as he concludes, he asks the audience the same question. Who today is packing your parachute? Friend, can I encourage you? None of us are where we are by ourselves. Somebody's encouraged us. Somebody's invested in us. Somebody's taken some time for us. Somebody's been there for us. Somebody's taught us something. Somebody's provided an example. And every one of us has somebody that we can look to and think. As Paul comes to the end of his letter to the Romans... In the last chapter, he spends a lengthy portion thanking those who helped him in the ministry, those who provided housing, those who gave him food, those who gave him monetary support. It was just expression of gratitude. And Paul said, I want to make sure my brothers and sisters in Christ know that I'm thankful. I would submit that all of us tonight are surrounded by people who are packing our parachute. May you and I go on the war path to look for people that we can thank, that we can acknowledge, that we can appreciate that we can express gratitude for. 
Let's determine tonight to stop taking people for granted. Let's take it upon ourselves to express gratitude. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him to sin. The Bible says withhold not good from them to whom it is due is in the power of thine hand to do it. If you and I can be an encouragement to somebody, if you and I can express gratitude to somebody, then let's do it. God says, look at the locust. They are working together. They're unified. But notice about the locust letter B. They're unselfish. He says in verse number 27, they have no king. No one is there providing this oversight, yet the unity is still intact. Now, friend, that means we have no excuse because God wants you and I to live in unity, and we do have a king. The Bible says in Psalms 47, For God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding to him. And we do have a king. We have an overseer. We have one who will empower us to live in unity in our life. And James 3 gives us insight to how we can have this unity. Beginning in verse 13, Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devil. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is first above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. You know the secret to having the kind of unity God wants you and I to have? Purity. It's first pure, then peaceable. And when you and I recognize we have a king, and when I'm right with God, when my horizontal relationship is right, all of my, when my vertical relationship is right, all of my horizontal relationships benefit from that. And when I first insist on purity, then I will have the peace that God wants me to have. Now, God is not saying that we should have peace at any price. We understand that we are to contend for the faith. But it is a lot easier to live unified with people when we are first seeking to be purified. And I would just challenge all of us as children of God, may we seek to live a pure and holy life. And when we do, unity comes much easier in every relationship that God has given to us. Fourth exhibit, and we're done. The intruding spider. The intruding spider, verse 28. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Now, as we, exhibit this, uh, as we examine this exhibit, what wisdom can we learn from the spider? Well, notice first of all tonight, that spiders take hold with their hands. Take hold with their hands. Now, it's pretty cool to watch a spider work, to create a web, to dangle from all kinds of places you wouldn't imagine, you know. And it would be kind of cool to be able to climb buildings with your hands. That would be, uh, you know, every Spider-Man enthusiast would love uh, this ability. And that's what the spider has in taking hold with their hands. But what does God teach us in his word that we should take hold of with our hands? Well, oftentimes God wants you and I to grab hold of truth and instruction. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.13, Take fast hold of instruction, let her not go keep her, for she is thy life. And then we see in Proverbs 23.23, 23, Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. God wants you and I to take fast hold of instruction and wisdom. God wants you and I to have the truth and to sell it not. God wants you and I to value his word. And just as the spider with her hands would create great works, God wants you and I to take his word in our hands and not let it go. And may you and I be willing to live according to the truth that we find in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the works of your hands. What is it that you're doing with your life? Some in here work with their hands. They make, they fix, they create. But let's think about the big picture. The life that God has given to you. The breath that he's gifted you to breathe. What are you doing with that? What is your life? How will you be remembered? What is the work of your hands? What is the legacy of your life? What is there? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Many people in here are doing wonderful things, but God wants all of us at the end to lay down the end of our life that God has given to us, having feared God and kept his commandments having taken fast hold of his instruction and lived our life accordingly. So we see what she's doing with her hands. And then notice letter B, that spiders are in king's 
palaces. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. And it's incredible wisdom that we can learn from the spider. They're gifted, certainly, in what they can create. If you've ever walked into a good cobweb, you know that. If it's a black widow one, it stays with you a little longer, you know. And uh, it's quite amazing uh, what they can do. It's quite amazing where they can get to and, and, and what they can create. It's, it's incredible. If you ever knock down the cobwebs in your house or around your house or uh, around the bushes or whatever, and then go out the next day and there they are again. And it's like, man, how do they do that so fast and, and so efficiently? And how do they accomplish that? They're certainly gifted at doing what it is that they do. Well, God wants you and I to take fast hold of, of the truth that he's given to us, but then he wants us to put that into practice and to uh, be in, in living and then serving for him. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 16, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. God's gifted everyone in this room in a unique way. And God wants you and I to look at our life and to examine with the gifts that God has given to me, what am I doing? The Bible says of the spider, you're going to see her work in the king's palaces. And I think all of us tonight, the goal would be that you would see our work in heaven. That what's happening here and now is not for the here and now, but that it's for the time to come. And that when every one of us stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account, and we all will, that we'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And as our life is examined, that there will be crowns, that there will be rewards that we can lay them at the feet of Jesus Christ as an evident token of our appreciation and as something being earned by the fact that we are living for him here and now. Let's serve our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been created to serve him. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In Matthew 5, we're challenged to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Why? So they can glorify you and all your goodness? No, that they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God says, listen, I want you to take fast hold of instruction. I want you to create something beautiful and when people see it, they're going to glorify me. Let's spend our time in this earth serving the King of Kings and may that make an impact for all of eternity in heaven. And we know that God takes simple things to do great things. God takes ordinary people and does extraordinary things. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made us unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God says, listen, if you'll examine these exhibits, not of these animals. You know who gets the glory for this? God does. You know the common theme in these animals? They all have a problem. The ants are people not strong. The conies are but a feeble folk. The locusts have no king. The spider has no home. Every one of these has a problem. But every one of them can accomplish something great with the help of the Creator. There's incredible wisdom from insignificant creatures when we understand our need for dependency on the Creator God. And when we learn from these animals, you know what I need? I need a work ethic. I need to take some responsibility, learn a lesson from the end. I need faith. Conies know to survive. They're going to have to be in the rock. If we're going to survive every day, we've got to be in the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need unity. I'm not going to make it through this journey on my own. I'm going to need some help. And I want to live the kind of life that inspires unity in the relationships that I have. And then I need to use the gifts that God has given to me for his glory. And just as the spider had no home, and yet she ended up in king's palaces, this earth, this world is not our home. Heaven is. And when I'm living here, thinking of there, when I'm living here, investing in there, when I'm living here, laying up treasure there, that's what God wants. So as we take a walk through Proverbs 30 and these animals, let's glean this incredible wisdom. And tonight, let's apply these lessons 
And let's ask the Lord to help us as we do it. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for the relevancy of your scripture to our life here in 2019. Lord, as we look at our world, as we look at the relationships, as we look at the division, as we look at all of these things, as we look at our own life and our own family and our own church family, Lord, we are reminded of needs. And yet tonight as we look at your word, we see solutions. These are nuggets of wisdom that if we glean them and apply them, they'll help us in our life. So Lord, help us as we examine these creatures to glean from them something we can apply that would help us to live as you created us and that would be pleasing to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking about, how many would say, Gabe, you know, as we looked at these animals tonight and something about them that maybe God would want us to see, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. And I saw something tonight in one of those verses and one of those animals and one of those characteristics that I think God wanted me to hear that I need to apply. And I'd just like for you to pray for me as I apply that. I think it'll help me. I think God had that for me. And I want to put into practice what he's laid upon my heart. Could I just pray for you tonight? That's me. God spoke to me tonight. I saw something there. I think God had that for me. And I want to make sure I take it and apply it to my life and relationships. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your will and way would be done in this service and invitation. If there's one here who does not know you as Savior, I pray tonight they'd come. Give us the opportunity to share with them from your word how they can know for sure heaven to be their home. Lord, you tonight have been at work. May we now respond. May we learn the wisdom that you would have us to glean. And may we implement it into our daily life. And we'll praise and thank you for this. With every head bowed and eye closed, let's stand to our feet. The musician's already playing. Can I encourage you to come if God spoke to you or make invitation, altar right there at your seat. Just spend some time talking with the Lord and saying, Lord, uh, help me in my life. Maybe it's my work. Maybe it's my faith. Maybe it's unity. Maybe it's using what God's gifted me. But if God spoke to your heart tonight through one of these characteristics of wisdom that need to be gleaned and implemented, I want to encourage you to take some time with him. If you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior, I'd love to encourage you to come and let us share with you from God's Word how you can know for sure heaven will be your home. And Christian, let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we sure love you. Thank you for your word and the privilege to gather together tonight with our church family, to fellowship, to worship, to learn. And I pray that you'd help us to apply what we've heard tonight. May we make the adjustments necessary. May we draw closer to you and live for you. And I pray that by applying the wisdom of your word, that our life would be a greater reflection of you. May it make a greater difference in our daily life. And ultimately, may it draw people to you as their Savior. I pray that you bless our church family tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing there, if you would grab your prayer page, we certainly want to be in prayer for our pastor tonight and uh, looking forward to having him back on the weekend. Many requests uh, in the prayer page and people counting on us to uh, be in prayer for them consistently, and I want to encourage you to do that. Please remember Mrs. Uh, Gina Dunwoody and your prayers uh, for her health, her husband, Brother Jerry, and their family, if you would. The point is open tonight after the service for some fellowship and some food. Encourage you to take advantage of that. And then we're excited for this Sunday, uh, certainly our connection groups, the morning service, the happinesses series, and pastor being here and preaching. But then Sunday night, before the evening series, we're going to have the dedication ceremony for the new Eldon Lofgren Transportation Facility. Now, the ceremony is going to begin right at 430, but we're inviting the church family to get here about 4 you want to park over here, maybe where you normally would, and then we'll have the road closed on Lancaster Boulevard, so it'll be an easy walk 
uh, out the driveway on the road over to the new building. And if that's uh, a challenge, we'll have the shuttles running starting at 4 o'clock. And so get here, park where you normally do, take the nice walk over, grab a shuttle, go over. And then between 4 and 4.30, you can walk through the building, walk around the building. It's quite uh, a project, and we want you to see it and to enjoy it. Then at 4.30 sharp, we'll start the ceremony and uh, meet some people and recognize some people we want to thank for their uh, decades of faithfulness and service. And then we'll cut the ribbon and then get right over here for an evening service at 5 o'clock. So that's this Sunday, dedication ceremony beginning promptly at 4.30. But we're encouraging everybody that can, come early and uh, park, get over there, take some time to tour it, and uh, you're, you're going to love it. Get in there, see what's uh, created for the buses, uh, the storage for striving together for the church. Uh, when you get in there, it's more than you think. So it's going to be an encouragement to you, and we look forward to that time of celebration this Sunday, beginning at 4, ceremony dedication beginning at 4.30. I'm going to ask Dr. R to come and to close our service tonight in prayer, remind us of any request, and to think of our pastor, and let's pray one for another, and we'll look forward to returning together back on Sunday. The Gabe, I just want to say briefly, I talked to Brother Jerry Dunwoody tonight, and they have uh, stopped all medical care for her. She's on morphine. Uh, our pastor went over and prayed with Brother, Brother Dunwoody tonight. I really appreciate that. He was a deacon here. She taught here for a number of years. I remember went over and prayed with Brother, Brother Dunwoody tonight. I really appreciate that. He was a deacon here. She taught here for a number of years. I remember she was a junior high choir school pianist. My daughter led the choir there, and she just was just a good lady, great English teacher, great music teacher. They have an 18-year-old daughter named Kate and a 16-year-old son named Jerry Jr. And especially be a prayer for them, of course, Brother Jerry as well. And in light of all that, we're thankful for heaven and uh, the home of the just men made perfect. And I'm thankful for a pastor to drive a good distance over to be a blessing to a former deacon and the family that was there gathered there tonight. Let's pray at this time. Lord, we do pray for the Dunwoodies. I pray for Jerry and Jenna. I pray for Jerry Jr. and Kate. I pray you give them grace during this time. We claim the promise that your grace is sufficient and your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, I pray that we can be an encouragement to them. I thank you that our pastor was able to do that even today. And Lord, we pray for these many other requests. We thank you for the dedication of the Old and Lofgren Transportation Building next week. Uh, what a tremendous tool that will be for our bus ministry, for striving together. We thank you for that, for so many that have sacrificed for that. We thank you for the tremendous results of just two weeks ago, with over 100 visiting families and over 100 people getting saved. We thank you for that, Lord, and I pray you help us to follow up. And Lord, we stop tonight. We pray for those in our church who have health issues. I pray for Joanne Lofgren. You be with her in her battle with cancer. Brother Bob Hightower, you be with him. I pray for Brother Ron Chow as he fights muscular dystrophy. I pray for just your help on on their lives and so many others, Lord, uh, who would like to even be here tonight and cannot be here. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to represent you well as we go out into this week and to be the Christians you saved us to be. Thank you for this practical Bible study tonight. I pray you help us to learn from it and to apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.